ございます、えー、次のセッション、えー、次のセッションは、えー、ケルシー・ハイタワーさんによるマネージメントコンテナーズスケールビスザコーオーエスキューバネーターズですよろしくお願いしますはい、そうです。This talk,、um, I assume a few things about this talk.、Um, this talk, I assume you know what containers are. So, how many people know what containers are? Fantastic. I will not be giving an overview of containers.、Um, I am going to talk about how do you scale these containers, right? So, the things that go in the container,、uh, we're just going to consider it an abstraction. It could be Ruby, it could be Perl, Python, Go. It won't matter for this talk. We're just going to assume that the container will be the contract that we'll, we'll work with. I am going to introduce all these components, and there will be like live demo the other 50% of this. But before, before I get started, this is my second time to Tokyo. How many people have ever been to the robot restaurant? This is a very amazing place where robots fight each other, there's music and dancing. If you've never been to the robot restaurant, do yourself a favor and go immediately after the conference finishes. Go there. And if you do go, invite me because I want to go again. Let's get started with the talk. So, today we're going to talk about how we manage applications today. So, today applications are tightly coupled to the machines.、Uh, most people are using some form of configuration management.、Uh, most people are writing infrastructure as code. So, if you're using Puppet, Chef, or Ansible, you're probably falling into this, this group of infrastructure as code. And I consider all of these tools, configuration management, scripting frameworks, mainly because you write in a high level DSL. And what out comes the other side is basically a set of shell scripts that run and execute on a machine. And some people are just using shell scripts. So, configuration management,、uh, one popular configuration management tool is Ansible. So, here's what an Ansible playbook looks like. So, here I'm doing something really simple. I'm taking a Go statically linked binary, so there's no dependencies. I'm, I'm putting the binary on the server. And then I'm installing a systemd unit to start this service. And then down here, I'm ensuring that the service is started. So, this is the playbook that describes the Hello application. Now, what you do in configuration management world, normally you have a bunch of machines and you map applications to these machines. So, here's my inventory file, and here's all the machines that should be running the Hello application. So, this is where we start to couple our applications to our machines. So, ahead of time, You need to make this decision on which machines have to run which applications. And this is what kind of prevents you from scaling above this, right? You have to have a human manage something like this. Now, configuration management is great for managing a virtual machine, a physical server, or even your laptop in your dev environment. But the truth is, it's not a great fit for actually managing applications. The reason why is that configuration management. Treats machines as first class citizens. So then you have things where people name machines after, I don't know, Power Rangers. You give them special names, you treat them special, you care about them. And you end up having too much responsibility on the machine. So the machine goes down, everyone panics, and tries to get the machine back up, mainly because that's where the application lives. And this is what configuration management promotes. The problem with that is you pin your applications to your machines. So, what we need to do is we have to move past this way of thinking. We need to move past the shell script. The idea that you take a machine and you script it, right? That won't scale. What we need to do, or I will replace you with a scheduler. How many people know what a scheduler is? How many people know what operations is? All right, so if you're a developer, like there's IT people in this room. So, either you write code, you manage the code, or you ask people to write code, right? You're in one of those groups. And the people that write code tend to build applications and they hand them off to the people that deploy or manage code in production. Now, if you're someone that manages code, you're probably your, your company scheduler, right? You're the person that figures out which machine the application needs to run on, right? The problem with you, though, you're human, right? You need to go to sleep. And if I wanted you to be highly available, I would have to give you like a phone, right? So if the server goes down, I'll give you a call until you wake up and reschedule the application. That's not very schedule,、uh, scalable. So, in the future, the way we're going to manage applications is we're going to decouple 
the application from the machine. So we won't use the same tools to manage machines that we do for applications. Maybe we'll get there one day, but today I don't think that will be possible. Configuration management will be great for managing machines, um, but we're gonna use a better abstraction for what an application is. So instead of writing a script on how to deploy a specific app, we're just gonna put them in containers, and we're gonna use that container and we'll hand it off to a better tool, something like Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is specific to applications. So Kubernetes doesn't try to manage virtual machines. It doesn't manage firewall rules. It doesn't manage anything dealing with the underlying physical world or rep rep represents a machine. I'm gonna do a quick recap of what containers are. A lot of people treat containers like virtual machines. I think this is a mistake. Um, a container is not a virtual machine. It's a Unix process. What makes it feel like a virtual machine is the fact that it's isolated from the other processes. And one of those key isolation points are the network namespace. So in the case of Docker, if you're using Docker, um, every container gets its own IP address and a, a set of corresponding point, ports. The key thing to remember is that application containers are what we're talking about today. So this is quite different than what you see in OpenVZ or in some web hosting setups that use containers to look like virtual machines. We're talking about application containers. And application containers are the application itself, so this is your application, and anything that it depends on. And for most people, the dependencies include things that are on the operating system. This would be like the libraries that your application links out to. You take those, you put them together, and you, out comes an image. The image is the thing that we store, we share, and we sync around to machines. You can do that manually, but today we'll be talking about doing that with the scheduler. The other part is the runtime environment. So for most people, this is Docker, and Docker sets up C groups, namespaces, and the environment variables for your containers. Now, when most people build a container, their containers are pretty big, right? People are building containers that are 500 megs. I've seen some two gigabytes. And the reason for this is most people do this when they build a container. Most people start from a full operating system, right? So this is a Docker, um, build file, so let's call it a Docker file. And what I'm doing here is I'm starting from uh, Debian Jesse release. I'm downloading the source code for Golang and all of the dependencies to build that source code. I'm compiling Golang from source, and then I'm just going to copy my application in once it's built. This is incredibly wasteful. It's nice that this is a repeatable process that you know that you can compile your runtime and copy in your application but this is just unnecessary size if you wanna do this at scale. What we need to do is consider separating the logic of building our application and deploying our application. Those are two different steps. So to build an application, we can do something like we did before, you know, take that build file and produce the artifacts. And then what we could do is take those artifacts, the inspector artifact, and then just add it to our container. What we end up in this case it's just something that's gonna be about four megabytes in size. This is much easier to deal with and scale across multiple servers. So now that brings us to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is a container management and scheduling um, framework, right? And I say framework because it isn't like Heroku. It isn't like um, Cloud Foundry. It isn't a platform as a service. It's a couple of steps below that. Right? It's a scheduler, and it has some primitives to keep your applications up and running. Now, everything in Kubernetes is API-driven, so there's no infrastructure as code. You won't be scripting things. You won't be describing things that way. Um, there's agents that live on each node that monitor state of the cluster in a centralized way. Then we have controllers that are actively enforcing state uh, across all your machines. And then there's a unique concept in Kubernetes called labels. And labels are arbitrary key value pairs that we give to our nodes, we'll see our pods, application services, um, and it forms the basis of service discovery. At a high level in Kubernetes, there's a the concept of a node, but we're not talking about managing virtual machines, OpenStack, any of that. But the concept of a node is something that gives us resources. So where do we get our CPU from? Where do we get our memory from? Where do we get our storage from? 
We get those from nodes. And then we have the concept of a pod, and we'll talk about what a pod is. We have a scheduler, so this is a thing that will be responsible for placing containers on machines that have enough free resources. And then we have replication controllers, and we'll talk about those in detail. And then the idea of services, and services give us the ability to do service discovery. So as we have a scheduler that's automating the placement of containers across a set of nodes, we need a way to find them so we can send them traffic. Here's what a node looks like, so here's uh, five nodes, and each node is responsible for creating volumes, containers, and that's being done by three components, three major components that live on that machine. You have Docker. Docker is a container runtime engine, so it's responsible for creating the containers. You have the kubelet, and a kubelet's job is to carve up the server, right? So the kubelet owns the server. It can slice up networking, it can slice up storage, and it can also talk to Docker to tell it what containers it should create. And then you have a proxy. And what the proxy does, it sits there, and it allows you to find pods no matter what server they're on, and we'll see that in the live demo. Here's what a node manifest looks like. So here is a YAML file that describes a node object inside of Kubernetes. So here there's node name, a couple of labels, and an external ID. Now, in Kubernetes, as nodes come up, they automatically register themselves with the API server. But you can actually do this in two steps, where someone racks the machine, and then someone adds it to the cluster when they're ready. And if you were to add it manually, you would create one of these specifications. The next thing is a pod. So we talked about containers before. And containers are really great for parts of your application. But what's common is most applications are made up of one or more containers. So what a pod does, it gives us the ability to pack multiple containers. You can imagine if you're writing, uh, let's say, a Ruby application. And that Ruby application could have a web front end like Nginx or Apache. And then you could actually have the application itself and then maybe you want something like a local memcache instance to run side by side with your application. The way you do that in Kubernetes is you would describe a pod. And all the containers that live in one pod, they share the same namespace, network namespace. So that means they can address each other on localhost. When you go to build a pod, here's what those specifications look like. We have a set of labels, and these are important if we ever want to locate our pods in the system. And then we have this specification, one or more containers and what images we need to use to actually pull down that container. Now this will be scheduled atomically to the nodes. So this is what the scheduler sees. This will um, take into account if there's any memory restrictions and find the right node that can actually run this particular pod. The next thing we have is the scheduler. So again, the scheduler's job is to take those pods and find a healthy node in the cluster. So in this case, this node, one, it was the best fit to run this particular pod. Now, the scheduler is pluggable in Kubernetes, meaning if you wanted to use Mesos scheduler, you could, or if you wanted to write your own scheduler, you could. But by default, the schedule that you're gonna get by default um, does a pretty good job. Then we have this, this idea of a replication controller. Now, a replication controller's job is to manage a set of pods. So if we want to ensure that our pod is always running, we use a replication controller to monitor its status. And it monitors those statuses by looking at a set of labels. We can do things like online resizing. So we can go from one pod to three pods by using a replication controller. Replication controllers also provide self-healing. So if one of the nodes were to die, the pod will be rescheduled to another machine. So this is a coordinated process. The replication controller notices that a machine has died. It creates a new pod from a template, and a scheduler finds the next best server to run that particular pod. Here's the specification for a replication controller. So the things that are important here is the template. So we start off with one pod. Here's the set of labels that we want to track. And then we don't see it here, but basically this would be a list of containers that make up this pod in this template. 
So the replication controller will scale these. The next thing is a service. So a service basically is a proxy that runs on every node that watches the Kubernetes API and it looks for a cluster configuration and when it finds it, it creates a virtual IP for each service. So a service maps to one or more pods, right? And by default we get basic round robining and we get dynamic backends based on labels, right? So as the pods show up, we get new labels on those pods and we can actually find them in the system and then our service will load balance across them. Here's what a service looks like. So basically, we can specify the set of labels our service to track. So if we, if we launched pods earlier that had name equals web and environment equals production, this one service will load balance traffic across all of the pods that have those matching labels. And this is how service discovery is handled in Kubernetes. So that's the end of the slides. The rest of the talk will be live demos. We're gonna go through all of those concepts and see what it's like to deploy an application, scale it, and get traffic to it. So earlier, what I've done is I set up this 10 node cluster. So this is running uh, in the cloud. Let's make sure that it's still running. I'm gonna refresh the page really quick. So what we have here uh, is 10 nodes. And what we're looking at now are the resource metrics. So we see the CPU in purple. We have the memory uh, in a lighter shade of purple. And then we have the file systems. So these are our 10 nodes um, performing activity. Uh, much of this demo will be on the command line. And to make it easy for people to kind of follow along, I'll follow this script as we do the demo. Now this, this thing will be available after the talk if people want to go through and try the exact same commands but I'll use this to uh, track our progress. So earlier I created a demo namespace. So in Kubernetes, we have this idea of namespaces, right? And what we can do with namespaces is we can have, we can give out credentials to give certain groups of people inside of our organization the ability to deploy and create containers in specific namespaces. If we were to look at our current system, I can use the kubectl command line tool and I can get a list of our namespaces. So currently I have three namespaces. I have the default namespace, which is something you get out of the box. I have a demo namespace, which I created specifically for this particular presentation. And I have a kube system namespace. And in the kube na system namespace, that's where things like the Kubernetes web UI we just saw runs, things like the cluster DNS service, and we partition these things so that way we don't have people deleting things by mistake. When we hand out credentials, we'll hand those out for specific namespaces. So we're gonna be using a demo namespace throughout this talk. Now the first thing that I'm gonna to need to do is make sure that my cluster's healthy. So I'm going to run the Kubernetes git cs command. And what this will allow me to do is get back the status of my cluster. So what we're seeing here is that the replication controller manager is healthy. The scheduler is healthy and ready to go. And etcd is something we didn't talk about. That's where all cluster state is stored for Kubernetes. Everything lives in etcd, and the only thing that talks to this database is a Kubernetes API server. Now, we can explore the Kubernetes API by using uh, various um, arguments to the git command, so we can get um, a list of pods, and we'll see in the, this namespace there are no pods running. We can get a list of nodes, and basically, this is kind of big here, we have 10 nodes running, in our cluster, and they're all in the ready state, meaning that they're ready to go and start taking work scheduled by the scheduler. And the next thing we can also do is look at the list of services that we have running. So currently we have no services running, so this is a clean slate. Now the first thing we wanna do is create a replication controller. Now earlier I showed you doing this from a specification file, we can actually do this from the command line and have Kubernetes automatically generate this for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a pod or replication controller that's gonna spin up one instance of a pod call inspector. And what the inspector pod does is it allows me to look at the network, environment variables, and mount namespaces inside of a container. So what I'm gonna do is create a replication controller with this command. 
So I'll call CoCTL run inspector. And then I want to use the image from this particular repository under the Kubernetes up and running namespace version 1.0. And we're going to give it a few labels, mainly that the track is stable and the app name is inspector. I hit enter here and Kubernetes creates a replication controller. Now replication controllers are responsible for creating the pods. So that the minute we create this, what we end up with is a new replication controller. So this replication controller is responsible for keeping one replica up and running. Now if we were to do get pods, we'll see that the replication controller noticed that the pod wasn't there and spun up a new one based on its template. Right, so now we have one instance of our pod running. Now we can describe what's inside of that pod by using the kubectl describe command. And we get a lot of information here. The things that are important are here towards the top. Notice the name has a random name, which was generated by the replication controller because we're going to have more than one of them at any given time. It lives in a demo namespace. It's using this particular image. And it got scheduled to node number nine, right? So we didn't specify what node we wanted. The scheduler took care of that. And in this case, number nine was rep uh, elected as the best fit. And it has these labels and it's up and running. Now every pod gets its own IP address. So that IP address represents a cluster IP address. I can't hit this from my laptop remotely. Right, that's a bit of a problem for most people that are new to Kubernetes. These are internal IP addresses. Um, and we also get this uh, list of events. So there's tons of events that happen here. Basically what happens anytime anything happens in Kubernetes, we get a stream of events that flow out of the API server. And we can actually track those events in other systems or tools. Now, we can also scale the number. So once we have a replication controller, we can go from one pod to 10. And the way we're going to do that is using the kubectl scale command. So the first thing I'll do is open up a new terminal. And I'm going to watch. So there's a nice flag called watch or watch only. And what this allows us to do is pay attention to the set of events that flow through the system. So I'm going to watch for any pod events that come through the system. The next thing I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to actually scale the replication controller. So now we're going to change the state inside of Kubernetes to tell it that now we want 10 replicas instead of one. So we hit enter here. And notice what happens. We see all these events flowing. Pods are going from pending to running. And it's pretty fast. So now we actually have 10 new pods up and running. We'll see that they probably land on the, on the nodes that higher, have higher CPU usage or higher memory utilization. Let's go back to the tutorial really quick. So at this point, if I were to do kubectl get pods, we'll see that we have all of our pods up and running. Now they're running on various machines throughout the cluster, right? That's not something we attempt to control. The idea of using Kubernetes is we take a group of machines and we make them look like a single machine by using a single API, a single entry point into the cluster. So here we have our 10 pods running. But again, none of those pods are accessible at this point. They all have private IP addresses inside of the cluster. So how do we make them accessible? So what we're going to do now is we're going to expose the inspector service to the outside world. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually use a YAML file to describe my service. So what we're going to do here is this set of metadata applies to the service. We're going to ignore it for now. But the things that are important about our service is what we see in the spec se section here. So what we want to do now is we're going to create a node port. And what a node port does, it allows us to bind to a high port on every service in the cluster to accept traffic for this set of pods. And the way this works is it's going to find all the pods that have at least a, a label called app equals inspector. Right? And the way that looks is if you were to think about this, it would be like kubectl get pods. And if we were to do a label query, we could say name equals app. 
And actually name equals inspector. What is our query looking at again? App equals inspector. Let's make sure that we did this correctly. Ah, app. All right, so what happened here is I did a label query for a label set called app equals inspector. So this is what the service will use to look for pods to send traffic to. If we were to look for a different label, let's say um, inspector two, we won't return any pods, right? So this is how the service works. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to create the service by calling kubectl create, we'll give it dash f and the name of the file. So what we'll do here is we'll create that service described inside of that particular manifest. And we notice something here that's giving us a warning letting us know that port 36,000 was allocated on all 10 machines listening for traffic for those pods. So what this means is if we were to describe this particular service, you'll notice the number of endpoints. It shows us the first three and then there's seven more. That means that a label query found 10 pods, and those 10 pods will actually receive traffic if we send it to it. Now, what I can do is visit one of the machines on port 36,000, and we see that we found the inspector pod. And this is a very simple application written in Go, and all it does is give me the current version here. It lists all the environment variables, so when you launch a pod in Kubernetes, you get a bunch of environment variables. You actually get one for each service inside of your cluster. It's a little bit too big. And then we also get networks. So we can actually see that this particular pod has the IP address of 10.206.10. And I can also look through its mount points, All right? So one thing that Kubernetes does by default, if you ever need to talk to the Kubernetes server, it will automatically bind mount in a list of secrets that will allow you to talk to Kubernetes. So inside of your pod, this will be injected for you automatically. And you can actually use this cert, don't copy that, or this uh, token to communicate to the API server. And this is automatically bind mounted into your application by the Kubelet itself. So, that allows us to get um, to each node or each, here I'm talking directly to one node in the cluster. Again, this isn't very scalable because if that node were to die, I have no way to get the application. So what I wanna do instead is I wanna expose the same service using Nginx. So Nginx is a nice uh, web server um, that can also be used as a proxy. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to log into my Nginx machine so this machine is outside of the Kubernetes cluster. And I'm, what I'm going to do is use Nginx as an external load balancer to forward traffic into the cluster. Now the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to create an uh, Nginx configuration for the inspector service. So what I'm doing here, I'm not putting all 10 servers in the back end. I'm just putting uh, the first four and I want to send traffic to each backend on port 36,000. And then I'm going to have a virtual host, so HTTP header, if it comes in looking for this particular host name, it will be round robin load balance between the backends listed here. So this is a standard Nginx configuration. And what I'll do is make sure that my Docker Nginx container is running. So I ran a Docker container that's using that set of configuration. And if this works, I should be able to hit this URL because I have an entry in my local host. And then I should actually be able to see the service up and running. So now I see the exact same service running through Nginx. And if we refresh this, so this one round robin to 207.11. If I refresh, you notice we get a new IP here, which is a different pod somewhere in the cluster. And if you keep doing this, you should continue to get different pods 
in a round-robin fashion throughout the cluster. So at this point, we're now using Nginx to service our cluster um, externally. Now, once you have your application up and running, now we have version 1.0 deployed. The next thing you want to do is how do you handle application upgrades? We want to go from version 1.0 to version 2.0. How do we do that? Well, one pattern I like to use is called the canary pattern. And the canary pattern, what we do is we take a smaller, a new replication controller, we deploy it side by side with our existing replication controller, and instead of having 10 replicas, I'll just do a smaller number like two. So we'll have to 12 total instances of our application running, but two of them will have version 2.0. I'm just going to deploy them side by side. Now one thing you should pay attention to is that the service we created earlier only required that that one label be set, app equals inspector. It's, ex ex um, it's on purpose we're ignoring the track label. The benefit of doing that is that we can have one service send traffic to two different replication controllers at the same time, right? So let's, let's deploy this and see what happens. So I'm going to exit out of Nginx. We'll use kubectl to create a new replication controller. Notice this time we're going to use the 2.0 image. Now what I'm going to do is instead of using my web browser, I want to, I want to be able to look at this a little faster. So I'm going to use um, curl to go through and iterate. And we can see that we have already found the canary service. So we're still hitting the same URL as before, going through Apache. And we see that one service is being able to proxy to both sets of replication controls. So we see 2.0 and 1.0 intermixed, right? Now, a common request is, how do I get um, customers to see traffic going only to the new version, right? Maybe some customers only want to see the new version. How do we do this? Well, the nice thing is we can actually create a new, uh, new service. So if we take a peek at this service called the Canary service, the difference here is that in our specification, the selector wants app and track. So this will ignore the existing 1.0 controller because it won't meet this definition, right? And the way that will look is kubectl, get pods. We'll see all of them. And then we want to see the ones that only have track equals. And you see that we only get two pods. Right? So putting that selector there, we qualify the query a little bit, and now we only get those two that are managed by the new replication controller. So at this point, we'll create this new service using kubectl. So now I get a new service running on port 36,000. And I can do kubectl get services. And we'll see that we have our two now. We have our inspector and we have our canary. And once we have those, we can actually go back to Nginx and just create a new vhost. So if I log back into Nginx, we can peek at our vhost entry. And we just have a new one. The new one says anything that comes in looking for canary dot inspected that Kubernetes up and running that IO will be proxied behind these backends on port 36001, right? And if we were to visit this IP, let's see what I have in here. If we were to visit this IP address inside of our web browser or host name, let's figure it out. Here's our canary, and we'll see that we hit uh, 2.0. One nice feature about Kubernetes is the ability to self-heal. So remember earlier we talked about a node going down and the replication controller replacing it. 
The way we can do that, and I'll set this up, we'll watch again. So let's watch for changes. We're going to watch for any new pods to change in our cluster. And then what we're going to do now is I'm going to find one of my canary nodes, right? We only have two of those. So we, we find the canary node, so we have two. And then I'm going to delete one of them, and we're going to see what happens. So we're going to delete a pod, and we're going to pick one of these. So we delete the pod. It's gone now. And notice what happens on the watch. So a couple of them went from running. This is the one we deleted. It's no longer running. And a new one was created in its place automatically. We didn't have to do anything or specify anything because the replication controller wanted to see two of those running. So now if we were to list our pods, we see that there's two canary pods running in our cluster. One is 26 seconds old. One is four minutes old. So we see that the replication controller is actually working. Another thing that's nice about um, using controllers this way is the ability to do troubleshooting. So if we describe our canary controller, we see that we have these two endpoints. But let's say we're having a problem with one of these endpoints and we want to troubleshoot it. We don't want to delete it. We just want to bring it outside of the replication controller. We still want two running. So how do we do this in Kubernetes? The first thing we want to do is we're going to find all the pods that are in that controller. And we found those by doing a label query. The next thing we're going to do is I'm going to remove the track label from this pod, right? So remember, these pods had two labels, app and the track they're in. Either you're in the stable track or you're in the canary track. What I'm going to do is subtract the label track from this particular pod. Now what happens is, if we list all of our pods, you'll notice we have three canary pods. And it's because the controller noticed that there wasn't two pods that had the exact label matches, so it sprung into action and created a new controller or a new pod. And this other controller that is now outside of the scope, so we delete it. I'll go back to where we delete it. So this pod, what we can do now is we can do things like kubectl. We can get the logs for this particular pod. So we're in troubleshooting mode at this point. Oh, that's the one we deleted. Where's the one we removed? Here we go. This is the name of the pod we removed. So what we can do is do things like get the logs for this pod. So since it's out of service, it's not dead, and we have the ability to grab its logs. So we don't need to know what machine this particular application is running on. We can actually just talk to the API server and have it automatically redirect us to get the logs for this particular application. So that's how you troubleshoot in Kubernetes. And once we're done, we can go ahead and delete that pod. Right? We have no other use for uh, this pod, so we can delete it now once we're done with our troubleshooting. All right, so that pod's gone. So at this point, we're getting ready to wrap up here, is now that we have the canary and we have our stable running side by side, and let's say we're happy with the state of things. 2.0 isn't causing any issues. There are no exceptions in the logs. We're ready to roll 2.0 out to every machine in the cluster. And we're going to do that with the rolling update command. So what I'm going to do is set up two, a couple of terminals. So here, we're just going to kind of mimic what end users would do. And we'll see that we get 2.0 every once in a while inside of our cluster. It may be sporadic because of uh, the behavior of Nginx introduced. So we see 2.0. And what we want is 2.0 across the board. All right, so that's working. Now what we're going to do is watch for state changes in Kubernetes. All right. So since we're not making any changes ourselves, we don't see anything happening. The next thing I want to do is I want to 
run the rolling update command. So here we're calling kubectl rolling update. We're going to update the inspector controller. So not the canary controller, but the first controller we made, which is the inspector controller. We're going to update every three seconds. We're going to kill a pod and have this replication controller automatically schedule a new one. And what we're going to do is do this in place. We're just going to change the image version. So we want to roll this to 2.0. So when I run this command, what will happen is the first thing is we create a temporary controller. So here's creating a temporary inspector controller. And what it's going to do is going to scale down the inspector controller to nine and scale this one up to one. So it'll continuously do this until we have them all migrated to the new version of the application. And while this is happening, we see the events coming into the system. The new pods are being named after the temporary controller. And this will continue every three seconds until we cycle through 1.0 to 2.0. And on the other side, this is what people are seeing. So as they continuously make requests, um, what we should see is some temporary pauses here and there, but we'll see 2.0 show up more and more often as we continue to update the application throughout the cluster. As you can see this already, almost half of the requests now are seeing 2.0. And we can monitor this. So here we're at five and five. And we have five more to go. And then we'll have a full deployment. Now, as this is progressing, we can actually view most of this information inside of our web UI. We notice the CPU is rising for some of these nodes. Can refresh it really quick. You do have different views. So we can look at all the pods in the system. And you see these are all the pods. You can actually drill into them, see what node that they're running on. We can also look at all of the events. So there's tons of events being generated right now in the system. For some reason, I can't see them. Ah, it's taking the internet a while to get there to reload this page. So make sure our thing is still progressing. All right, we have two more pods to roll over. One more, and we see the events are still, still flowing. And one more to go, and we should have 2.0 across the board. And let's look at progress here. And now we pretty much have 2.0 across the board. There will probably be one more left. And at the end here, once we have zero pods in the old controller, we'll rename the temporary controller to the previous name. That way we can use it later. So now that we're at the end of our loop, we're renaming the temporary controller to the existing one. So now we have inspector across the board. We have 2.0 running across our cluster. And with that, I'd like to complete the demonstration. Thank you. So the question was, how easy is it to dynamically add a node or remove a node in case there's failures? So I'll try to answer the question live. Let's just do it now. So what we can do is if we wanted to add a new node to this cluster, what we should be able to do is, uh, so what I did earlier, I created a few scripts to set this up for me. GCE Kubernetes. So I have a couple of scripts here, and one of them is called create worker. And the idea here is I can create a worker, 
And I'm just going to give it a new name. So kubectl, if I do a listing of all the current machines in our, in our cluster, we have these 10 machines named node 0 through node 9. And based on your question, how easy would it be to add another node? So we would do create a worker instance, and I'm going to call this one 10. And what will happen is this will spin up a new virtual machine inside of the cloud. And this machine, um, because of a startup script that I have, this worker startup script, and we'll take a peek at this script. So this worker startup script here, a couple of important things happen in the startup script. One, I configure Docker. So this block here will put Docker in place and we'll, we'll get it all configured. The next thing that we'll do is we'll start the kubelet on that machine. And we'll also tell the kubelet to register itself with the API server, right? So once the kubelet registers itself with the API server, the replication controller, there's actually another component called a node controller. We'll notice that and add it to the cluster. So let's see how far along. So it looks like our node is running now inside of the cloud. And what I should be able to do is use kubectl, get nodes. And I'll make this smaller. And we'll see if our node shows up. And there it is. There's node number 10 is available in the cluster. And if we go to the web UI, we'll see that there's now a new node here. So that's 10, right? If we want to remove a node, we can just delete it as well in reverse, and it goes away. So some of these nodes are running things. We know for a fact that, let's say, um, node kubectl get nodes. We know that one of these is important. Let's just pick number three. So node number three, we'll do, we'll just delete it. Node three. We're going to delete it, right? And then once we delete this, we'll just do a watch to see what happens. kubectl get pods watch only. And let's see what happens when we do this. We're going to assume that that node had some pods running on it. So now I'm going to say, yes, we want to delete it. And this may take, there's a five minute timeout on the node being dead and its pods moving. But once this node were to, to go away, let me just speed things up a little bit. Kubectl get nodes. And which node did we delete? We deleted node number three. So here, what we can do is kubectl delete nodes. And then we'll do node number three, which is this long name here. So now the node is gone. And if we wait for the five minute timeout, we'll see the scheduler move all of the pods to other nodes in the cluster. So this is another example of Kubernetes attempting to self-heal the cluster and making sure that we're back um, in the specification that we want. So that's, that's all it takes to add and remove nodes dynamically um, inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, great question. Thank you. Um, so, can you control the resource allocation by the features, like can you uh, restrict uh, specific machines to specific teams like that? Yeah, so the question is, can we restrict uh, resources by specific namespaces? So what you do in Kubernetes is this concept of a quota. And when you give out credentials in a Kubernetes cluster, you, you say that those credentials can see certain namespaces. And inside of that namespace, you can also have a restriction on the number uh, or the amount of quota that you can give. So the idea here, though, is that we don't want to treat any of the machines special. So we have a large pool of resources. And we can put quota specification in a specific namespace to say, look, you can only have 100 megs of RAM in this namespace and two CPUs. When you start scheduling pods, the minute you go over that allocation, the scheduler will just block and say, have no free resources to schedule inside of this namespace. And we do this because we don't want any of the machines to be special, right? We want to be able to plug in new machines. As they show up, the scheduler can then schedule resources there. So in the case of the quota, you have to increase the quota in that namespace and then those, the, then the scheduler will be able to do uh, the scheduling of that pod. That's how that works in Kubernetes. Uh, 
Cool. So I'll answer this one quickly because I know someone else has a question. So the question was, do I have any recommendations or best practices for running Kubernetes offline, so outside of the cloud in the data center? Um, that's typically how I run Kubernetes. So everything we did today, um, I wasn't using any of the specific cloud features other than the ability to spin up a virtual machine. Normally I can do this demo on my local VMware on my laptop. It works as well on bare metal. So the goal is just to get something like CoreOS installed, just to be clear. Kubernetes works on Red Hat, Ubuntu, SUSE, doesn't really matter the operating system. Um, but it is nice to have something with a later kernel, such as CoreOS. And once you have a kernel, Docker, Kubernetes, it will run pretty much anywhere. Your laptop, a data center, bare metal, OpenStack, it doesn't matter as long as you have some concept of a machine. Are you going to translate for me? This is awesome. I'm in the future now. This is magic, by the way. <laughs> um, I understood your Japanese perfectly. Um, so the question was, the question was, should we run um, development in the same environment with everything else? Well, the answer is no, don't do that. Someone's gonna make a mistake, and then you're gonna be on the news, and you're gonna be sad, so don't do that. Um, in one data center, the idea is that you will have multiple Kubernetes clusters. For the scale that most people run at, I think it's a good idea to have one development cluster and one production cluster. Even in production, you're probably gonna have multiple Kubernetes cluster in one data center. You don't wanna have, um, you know, if you only have 2,000 nodes in your data center and you just have one Kubernetes cluster, what happens if a Kubernetes upgrade fails? You're going to screw up your whole cluster. So what you want is to partition. Maybe it makes sense to have 500 nodes, 500 nodes, 500 nodes, 500 nodes, and you have some fault tolerance within the data center itself. For development environments, um, I would just take a smaller machine, give it a lot of resources, and have the development team write their code against that. But the same manifest will work in production and Kubernetes. Great question. So the question is, and I'll show people for context. So when we logged into the Nginx cluster, we had a Nginx configuration for our backends. Right? So here, we put four nodes here. Now, ideally, some people want this to grow and shrink based on nodes coming and leaving. How will we dynamically update those backends? Well, there's a couple solutions. I don't have time to go into detail here, but I've written a Lua module for Nginx that will automatically make its own queries into the API server of Kubernetes. Therefore, you don't have to hard code these backends. You also have the ability to use tools like, um, oh wow, I wrote, wrote a tool called CompD uh, a, a couple of years ago. And CompD basically allows you to do uh, something very similar to what you're asking. So CompD can watch a backend and update a template real time. So if we look at the documentation, we'll see um, we can manage a template. So for instance, if I scroll to the bottom here, bottom, bottom, okay, here. So for example, here is a Nginx template. So it's a Golang template, 
And you notice that the backends, my upstream backends, is basically looking for a key inside of etcd, and I can automatically generate this template. So if you look at this template, this is in Golang, and we were to render the template, it will look like that. So CompD is a tool you can use to go from a template to a rendered output file. And there's some people that actually use CompD in their commercial solutions. One of them is OpenDeus, which is like a Heroku uh, style platform as a service. And it actually uses CompD to do something very similar. It watches a backend with data about nodes. And based on that data, it gets fed into a template and it can automatically regenerate these. And the nice thing about CompD, CompD will automatically restart the service after it does a test on the config to make sure that it's good. And it can restart Nginx for you automatically to make sure that that's automatically updated for you. Uh, great question. Okay, so uh, the question was, how do you handle storage for things like databases? This initial release of, of Kubernetes um, is designed for stateless applications. Now we do have primitives for volumes. So Kubernetes does have the ability to manage things like DN uh, NFS, iSCSI, persistent disk inside of cloud, um, cloud systems or cloud platforms. So in that case, you would, you would deploy something like Postgres and you would specify a set of volumes. And maybe I can show you which one of those look like. I won't have time to deploy it, but maybe we can just look and see um, what it looks like. Um, if I can find one, I may not be able to find one in time. But normally what you would see um, in a case like that, I can't dig one up real quick, is that you would have the Postgres requires a specific volume. And that usually would be like a host volume because you want as if you restart the container, you want to make sure that it stays on the same host. If you really want to run a database and have something like Kubernetes manages it, you got to be careful because if you were to have your process die, what is Kubernetes going to do? It's going to reschedule the database on another node. If you don't have a clustered file system, that's it, you're down. You're going to be embarrassed in production. So would you suggest something like that to no, so no, no scheduler can help you when you're dealing with a database like Postgres. What you would have to do with Postgres is you can do something else. You can do something like, um, you can do something like this. You can actually deploy it locally on a specific Kubernetes node using something like either a static pod with no replication controller, or you can actually use the kubelet directly. So here's a list of manifest files, and here's a controller. And I do have etcd deployed this way, so very similar to a stateful service. So here, here's etcd, and I'm taking etcd. This is basically the etcd database, and I'm deploying it on the kubelet, so the kubelet will manage it locally. And I'm going to bind mount in a volume from the host. So in Kubernetes, I can, this could have been NFS, this could have been a persistent disk in uh, Google, it could have been an ESB, um, ESB block in Amazon. So I can specify volume. So down here, we see the etcd volume. And this could have been NFS, iSCSI. This is the abstraction. Once you name the volume, you can reference it inside of your pod manifest here. I want to use the etcd data volume. So this could be anywhere. And then this will be bind mounted into varlib etcd. So the fact that I'm running this pod specifically on this node, it stays there. So if you wanted to run Postgres, you would have Postgres master, Postgres slave, configure your replication and allow the kubelet to keep them running. Right, Kubernetes can't make a service that isn't cluster aware automatically cluster aware. There's a bit of orchestration that needs to take place. Good question, thank you. 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 Thank you.